first of all, um, welcome to Hong Kong, even though I know it's uh, probably a nightmare. Um, and, um, but should be fine now. Find some time to go to our countryside. Actually, Hong Kong is one of the few places on Earth where the countryside is just five minutes away, so it's a very nice place to go. Okay, today what I'm trying to do is look at um, the MSM network. So there are a few key questions I have in mind when I'm preparing this presentation. One is why network? And of course, the other things are what are the characteristics of the network that I'm talking about? And then are there any impacts now that we are talking about HIV treatment? And can we predict the future with better means of um, uh, looking at the um, um, vulnerable population? And then some conclusions. So um, this leads me to this uh, very old slide and, in fact, very old um, publication. Um, how many years ago? 35 years ago, when the first cases of HIV infection or AIDS at that time um, were reported among MSM, homosexual men. And that was uh, 35 years ago. And then after that, we, we began to see the rise of incidents in different places. And one key characteristic of this um, um, spread is the heterogeneity of the um, presence of HIV infection in different populations around the world. And this is a more recent slide on the right-hand side. On your right-hand side, you can see the, um, the global pattern by country. Again, is a very varied um, type of presentation when we are seeing HIV infection MSM, we are, it seems that we are not looking at one single population, but many, many different populations around the world. And of course, there are regional variations. So what are the challenges when we're trying to explain the HIV epidemiology in MSM? One is that there's a big discrepancy between what is observed and what is expected. So every time you try to plot this map, I can see many, many papers with this, you, you, you predict that it's going up, and then all of a sudden it comes down. And you predict that you, is, uh, there will be low, low, low bumps here and there, but as a matter of fact, it comes down. So those are some of the challenges we have to um, really keep an eye on. And there's very significant geographic and temporal variations. We begin to doubt whether the very conventional way of looking at epidemiology using incidence, preference, basic reproductive numbers, are they really applicable? And when we're doing modeling, is the SRR model, which is commonly used in infectious diseases, is still applicable when we are talking about HIV infection. So, of course, the impacts of interventions remain to be well teased out. So, let's move to one major assumption, which is common sense to everyone of us, but when we are doing statistics, we seem to forget, which is MSMs do not form a homogeneous population. So, with that, can we uh, can we rely on some other methods to look at the HIV situation? So how about network epidemiology? But when we, when we talk about network, we, 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 are, we are looking at ties, the, the connections between individuals. We are no longer only interested in the people who are infected. We are more interested in looking at the relationship between people who are infected, or people who are infected and people who are not infected with other ties. So that leads us to a skill which is well used and well versed in other disciplines like business and social sciences, which is social network analysis. But in social network analysis, normally the best way to do it is to go for a full network. So that's what Dr. Lowe was talking about, uh, um, the, the sampling. The, if, if we are able to have the full population sampling, of course we can do a full network. We know of each and every person and how they are connected with one another. Then we can have a good network analysis. But that is really ready available, so we have to rely on some other means. But has network analysis been really neglected? Not exactly. You look at this paper published in 1982 about um, cases of uh, KS and, uh, and PCP. Um, some of them, all of them are homosexual men. So they have a very detailed description in the MMWR. And nine patients with that, seven patients from whatever places, three patients here, and then some are connected with whom. Can we do something on top of that? And where we try, we try looking into this data, and then we draw our own map. So this is the first network map that we, if, 
if you care to look at the data which are available, you can come up with um, something like this. You know that these people are connected. These are the triangular patients, triangle giving you the shape of people who have got PCP. So you, it, it gives you, at least on display, a better representation of what is actually happening in this cohort of uh, patients who have been captured. But is it feasible to do full network analysis all the time? The, it is only possible in some cases, I think, in practice. One is in outbreak setting. When you have got outbreak happening, of course, you capture people who are having this, the infection you have in mind. In this case, this is uh, uh, STD, gonorrhea. Then you see all these people who are connected and how they are connected with one another. So outbreak setting is, an, is ideal when we talk about network analysis. But in non-outbreak setting, it's a bit of a nightmare. You have to go to all the different steps, interviewing individuals, finding out who is having these risk factors, who hasn't got the risk factors, and then doing all the analysis together and come up with a, with a conclusion. So non-outbreak setting, the network analysis is not ideal, but still it has been done. I'm very impressed by, by this group of uh, researchers uh, from <clears throat> who has been doing a lot of work in the 1990s, looking at the linkages of individuals with HIV infections and without HIV infection, but with the risk behaviors. You can just um, forget about all the details. So you look at some of these dots. You can see clearly from the backs, these black dots are the HIV-infected individuals, and then all these are linkages among one another. And then one interesting thing here is, in this particular study, they, the lesson that we can draw is, this is a study in Colorado Springs. It, they, they haven't given you a very high HIV preference over the years of, um, of the study. The reason, perhaps, is that the black dots that I just showed you were in the scattered areas of the networks and not in the, in the center. So that tells you that um, it's not just a density which is more important, but the centrality. Centrality meaning where the, pos where the, the person is positioned. So with those, there are additional studies that incorporate other data. So it's not just the social side, the risk factors that we're interested in. How about phylogenetics? So if two persons have got a virus, and the virus are very, very similar or identical, then you can assume that these two persons probably have been in some form of linkages. Perhaps there can be a third person, but at least you know that they are linked. So with these, you, we, we are able to go into network studies and think about doing a network study without the presence of full data. So this is the same study that I showed you about uh, gonorrhea uh, outbreak. But now I'd like to draw attention not to how these people are linked, but the black dots here. The black dots here represent people who have attended a certain bar. So it's not the individual is more important now, it's the location which is more important. So if we are unable to come up with a full network analysis, are we able to do something by drawing some conclusion or doing some analysis by looking into the affiliation of these people to a certain location? So that leads us to another concept, which is still within the network analysis, which is the principle of duality of person and <clears throat> group. So if two persons or three persons have gone to the same place, even though these three persons may not have known one another, we can assume that they are closer in terms of social contact. So that appears to be important if we want to look at HIV infection and the risk factors for its transmission among MSM, because invariably, they belong to different communities and sub-communities. So that reminds me of the bathhouse phenomenon in the 1980s. So the bathhouse or the, or the saunas are the locations where seeking sex partners or sex networkings were very common, even to this day. So if two persons or three persons or ten persons have been attending the same saunas for sex networking, then you can assume they're closer to people than the others who haven't attended the same places. And that is the principles of what we call a two-mode network. Well, one more network, we are referring to 
all the nodes being individuals. For two mode networks, we are referring to two types of um, nodes. One is, you know, is an individual, and the other is not the individual, but the location or the venue where people see sex networking. So this is one way of doing it. A study that we did and published some years back is to interview uh, uh, a, a, a number of um, uh, homosexual men and then asking about where they, where they have um, gone for sex networking, whether it was public toilets, bars, saunas, gym, party, all those. Of course, after it has to be done, if we do this, you have to do a lot of social science research. You have to do some qualitative studies to understand the characteristics of um, locations where MSMs are interested to go to. So with those and like a scale, we are able to come up with some forms of linkages. Uh, and then see how these people are related to one another. So that's the first network that we draw. So the, the yellow dots you see in, in the peripheries are, are the individuals, and then you have the red dots representing the locations where they come to know of one another. So you can see that they, it's not a homogeneous, a uniform type of distribution. It's actually quite clustered, and with those you, we can do a discriminant analysis because we can find that there are actually two broad categories of individuals. One is more familiar with networking through physical venues like sauna, and the other is the affiliation with the internet. And there was, there was, this study was performed in 2007. It's almost 10 years ago when we didn't have a common use of mobile phones. So we are working on additional studies to see whether this pattern is going to change. But as you can see that there are basically two different types of individuals. One is younger, with higher education level, more different partner types, and the other is older, lower education level, and less number of partner types. So that distinguishes people into, and when we, we are able to differentiate into different sub-networks. Instead of talking about homosexual men being one single community, it appears to us that there are a number of them and the characteristics of which can be determined using a two-mode network approach. So with that, what else can we do? Seeing the picture is not enough. I think for researchers, for epidemiologists, we are, we are never satisfied with just seeing the pictures and see how clustered they are. Are we able to measure something? Just like what we are doing for uh, conventional epidemiological studies, look at incidence of preference? Yes. One is look at the temporal change. Why can't we plot them and see how they are, how they are moving, how, whether there any changes have occurred? So in two more networks, you, you can see that this is an, another, another study that we have conducted. You, you, just from the look at it, it appears that the, the network is becoming denser. If you tr translate them into, change them into one more network using some assumptions. For two more, we are talking about two types of nodes. For one more, we are changing all the nodes into just one single type, which is individuals. So people who are closely linked with one another appear to be clustered. And then you can see that same picture can be seen. And then we can also look at some metrics, which could be important. And I would suggest there are two, which are quite practically useful compared to the rest, which might be just more of academic interest. One is the density. So if a more ties in that particular community at first, that point of time, then you can assume that they are more closely related to one another. And the other is the centrality. It means whether some of the individuals are more centrally located, whereby the other individuals are more likely to come into contact with him or and for the risk behaviors that are about to happen. So that's a network matrix that we can rely on. And one thing which is also quite interesting is if we say um, individuals are networked, then locations can also be networked. It's just looking at the thing on the other, on the other way. So if you have a number of saunas or bath houses where MSM like to go to, so rather than just looking at where the MSM go to and whether they are linked with one another, can we say there are some saunas which are more favored by the individuals, so much so that they become what we call core saunas. 
So it would be important for interventions. So if, I think it would be more cost effective if you go to core zones because these are places where a lot of people have sex networking compared to the peripheral zones which are less well attended. If you translate all the information from the two mode network between individuals and locations to a one mode network which is composing of just the zones. And of course you can look at it from using other means of um, uh, uh, investigation. And with the growth of the mobile data, especially in Asia Pacific, you can see there I, I searched the internet and I'm very impressed with this particular slide. So you, you see that we are in the Asia Pacific region. You are seeing a lot, a lot of communication um, being established using um, the mobile phone and the mobile data is becoming increasing a lot. So that will be another venue that we have in mind, apart from just saunas, parties, bars, can we look at internet or the mobile um, uh, network as being a hub and see how people are connected and begin to do investigation of the um, connectivity pattern there. So what are the characteristics of um, MSMs that attract them to one another? There must be something. Of course, we can say that they are MSM, so they go to MSM saunas. That's not good enough. That's not an answer. It's just an observation in general. So there must be specific characteristics. What are these specific characteristics? I think we don't know all the answers yet. We don't know all the answers yet. I doubt whether we'll be able to, do, we'll be able to arrive at the conclusion. So one thing that we have in mind, of course, is the venues, locations where they like to go to. If the few of them like to go to certain venues, then it is one little sub-network. How about a phenotype form of approach? So I think we are attracted to one another by the, by the phenotype. So, um, so for MSM, it's, not, it's also not common to see that they are also self-identified in, in, in different body image types, like bear type, choppy type, uh, slender, whatever. I'm sure they are similar and they can be different when you come from other countries or other cities. Can we do something about it? So this is one uh, attempt to go in depth and then try to um, um, characterize the body image type of the individuals and the body image types of the partners that a respondent MSM said he would be interested to get in touch with. So this is the result. Forget about the statistics here, but just look at the colors. If the blue colors represent their higher affiliation, you will see that there are some phenotypes, body image types, which are more favored by different other types. And there are types which are more in isolation. So this is another way, another way of looking at the MSM networks. So with antiretroviral treatment now um, prescribed almost universally when one is um, um, diagnosed with infection, does treatment matter? Does treatment affect the network? So this is, um, again, an old study, but there's a lot of inspiration from these old studies. You just look at the, these peaks, numbers, the numbers of club listing. Club listing meaning the listing of all the clubs, including um, Bath House. So you see, after the discovery of AIDS in the uh, early 1980s, there was actually a decrease, dramatic decrease in the number of um, Bath Houses. So if you have less, smaller number of venues for networking, then the networks composing of MSM would likely decrease. So even without doing network analysis. So to supplement that, we did another study just a couple of years ago, we are still working on the data, is look at whether an individual's behaviors in networking coming into contact with other MSM change with the message of HIV diagnosis. So on your right-hand side is after diagnosis, or left-hand side is before diagnosis. You can see the link of the bar representing the number of MSMs that have been partnered by a, by, by a certain respondent MSM. And then the lighter color it is, unfortunately it's the wrong color. The lighter color it is, the, the higher number, higher frequency it should have been. So you see that it's not just the reduction in the number of uh, partners in the year following diagnosis. It's also the decrease 
overall decrease in the number of, um, um, sorry, the uh, overall decrease in the frequency of networking that we are, we are witnessing. So this is one way of, another way of looking at the networking. So apart from seeing where they are affiliated, apart from seeing their body image type, we also see the treatment effect of it even before antiretroviral um, agent is prescribed. But with antiretroviral, of course, we know that it's going to change a lot of things. And apart from reducing the virus to undetectable level, knowing that the uh, transmission um, opportunities decrease, there's also this um, phenomenon of serial adaptation. So this, which means a modification of sexual behavior based on one's serial status. And this modification is also partner related. So it means something for a person after the diagnosis, after the treatment, whether he would be seeking partners of a different types when his serial status has changed. And with the serial status, also with the treatment, whether that, that has anything to do with the networking pattern. So most of the time when we talk about serial adaptation, we are almost invariably referring to the more favorable scenario of um, HIV positive MSM, linking up of HIV positive MSM. So at the end of the day, in epidemiological terms, it, it does not need to additional HIV infections. But it's hardly that um, simple. Though from other studies, we can see that after, after infection, that really is a drop. Uh, after the diagnosis, there really is a drop of, um, of, of, the, of, the, of the number of partners. But the thing is, are we creating another network by treatment? So we are seeing more and more HIV patients, and the HIV patient probably will, HIV positive MSMs will likely communicate with one another. They will also form a network of their own. So this is a study on hepatitis C. So what has hepatitis C to do with our, our HIV and networking or MSM networks? So we can see here that there's a cluster here. All of them are very similar. And where do they come from? They come from HIV positive individuals. And then if you look, if you read this graph on the, on, the, on, the, on the X axis, you have the year of HIV diagnosis. On the Y axis, you have the year of hepatitis C diagnosis. And the red lines represent the, the, the three um, genotype 3A patients who have got um, hepatitis C infection following HIV infection. So what it means is we are seeing a new cluster emerging because of the zero status. The zero status led to zero adaptation, allowing them to mix with one another. Of course, HIV does not spread, continue to spread. But the thing is, other infections can spread. So this is another impact of treatment. So can we project into the future? With all these new information messages, ideas, can we have a better image of what is happening. I think in these days we can't, we can't escape from modeling. So in the past we tried to plot this curve and see what is happening every time we plot this graph about what is going to happen in the next few years every time we fail. We fail many times. I'm sure many of you in the audience also fail. You, you try to project and imagine what will happen in the next few years but it may not really happen. So the modeling tool perhaps needs to be modified. So conventionally we use compartment model but now perhaps we should incorporate contact networks in the model. They will perhaps make things better. And the other approach, which is more, even more important, is a multidisciplinary approach. It's not just the um, social behaviors that we are interested in. It's also the viral load, because when the viral load is high, there is transmission. When the viral load is low, the transmission potential is low. There's also importance of using phylogenetic data to look at the similarities of virus by similarity of virus, I'm already inferring to the similarity of the individuals who are coming in contact with one another. So with that, we began to our new study. Uh, we, we have just started, and this is the pilot one looking at 45 MSM. And for each particular case with the clinical, and virological, epidemiological data, we try to estimate the data serial conversion. And they're assuming that infection probably will only occur when a person is HIV positive with a high viral load and see how it's related to all the other cases and look at whether we can use a concept borrowed from physics, meaning diffusion, 
to investigate HIV transmission. So with those, I think I have to summarize and close this presentation. Uh, on one hand, we are looking at um, HIV transmission, we are HIV transmission epidemiology. In fact, there are two separate components. One is the transmission risk when the virus is already in contact. So what I'm referring to are the virus burden and also the self-protective behavior. When there's self-protective behavior, of course, the chance of infection is lower. When the virus burden is high, the, the chance of infection is high. When there is treatment, of course, the chance of transmission is low. But all these would not make sense if you do not investigate their connectivity. That gives you not the infection risk, but the exposure risk. So the epidemiology should be a combination of the investigation of infection risk and exposure risk, or else it will not make a lot of sense. You can have a whole group of MSM with high risk behaviors, but you don't have one single case of HIV. How can it spread? So finally, allow me to draw the following conclusion. Firstly, that um, we understand that MSM is a heterogeneous population with a very diverse spectrum of exposure rates for HIV transmission. Secondly, the networking characteristics are important and they can be very local. So I can't see the future of, of an app or a program that anyone can just download and come up with their own study on the networking characteristics of MSM in the respective city or country. Thirdly, it poses infection, following infection, following treatment, that's another time point whereby we have to look closely. So we cannot just look at MSM in general, look at virus in general. There's a time point after diagnosis and after treatment whereby things will change. So in other words, networking is a surrogate of exposure probability, whereas conventional behavioral studies gives you the, an understanding of the risk factors for infection, only if there is an exposure. And we do need multidisciplinary approach, and we do need to have all these models or epidemiological studies tailored to local needs, as unfortunately, there's no universally applicable model for projecting HIV transmission in any country. So finally, let me thank um, the Council of HS Fund, Research Grant Council, they have been supporting my studies in the past 10 years. And it's the name of uh, the list of names of my students, postdocs, and colleagues who are helping out from different angles. We, we don't work on one aspect, uh, but when one person works on one aspect, then a combination would be a good multidisciplinary approach. So, thank you.